Hi, Misha here, and last time I put out a vacation video, kind of a just chatting with you, talking about the AR-18, AR-180, using some old footage I found while cleaning out a hard drive. And today, let's do that again. A couple of years ago, I had planned on doing a video comparing, contrasting these two guns, especially the the interior, the bolt group, the gas system. And it's really no wonder that they have so much in common because they have a common ancestor. Of course, on top we have the Swiss SIG SG550, aka the PE90, aka STGW90. On the bottom we have the Italian Beretta AR70 later replaced by the AR-7090. And their common ancestor is the SG-530-1 because in the 60s, SIG and Beretta had a partnership to develop a new rifle for this new fangled 223 caliber cartridge that the Americans had dreamt up and that the Russians were actually very intrigued by, but it wouldn't last. Nevertheless, some of the basic research would carry over, and uh, so in this video, let's, let's talk about it, how they are similar and different, all that, uh, all that good fun stuff. SIG 550. Basic specs and features are the same. They each have a barrel more or less 20 inches. The Beretta would go with the more conventional for the time one and 12 twist. The SIG would use a unique one and 10. The SIG was officially chambered for 5.6 GP90, whereas the Beretta was chambered for 5.56 by 45, 5.56 NATO. Same long stroke gas piston system, same reciprocating handle. Both feed from proprietary magazines with the same type of mag catch, although the mags are not readily interchangeable. Both have iron sights. Both feature synthetic furniture, stamped steel upper and lower receivers. The Swiss gun, at least eventually, would have a folding stock as standard. The Italian gun would actually have a fixed stock as standard, but a folding version was optional, and it's just a hollow stock, so it wasn't a big deal to replace it. The, the guns would take a long time to go into service, both not actually being adopted until 1990 officially, although limited use would be in the 1980s for both of them in their respective countries. With that, I'm going to hand you off to Misha from the past. For now, Misha in the present, 2022, is saying goodbye, and uh, I'll be back soon, still kind of on vacation. But it's shame. It seems a shame to waste this footage because I do take apart these guns and go over them. If some of the information I say from the past there is out of date, I apologize for that. But you know how it goes. Until then, enjoy the uh, rerun episode here. So before we really get into the five five zero and the AR seventy, we should look at what came before. Now this video is not really on the history of the Italian or the Swiss service rifles, so check out other videos for that. But these are relevant. Here we have the Italian Beretta BM-59. Now I brought out the paratrooper model just because it has a pistol grip. 
It also features a metal side folding stock. As you see, it also has a light bipod. It has what is known today as the Tri-Comp that acts as a flash hider, muzzle brake, grenade launcher. It also has a bayonet lug on it very similar to an M16, but not interchangeable. Grenade sides here. And we have quite a few videos on the BM-59s. These are essentially Italian reworked Grands to fire 7.62 NATO. And they feed from detachable 20 round rock-in, well they're kind of straight-in rock-in hybrid, interesting design magazines. And they use a lot of the same parts as the M1 Grand. Beretta would very quickly and very affordably develop these in the late 50s, starting around 1957, having prototypes ready by 58 and the final prototype ready by 1959. And these would start to enter Italian military service in small numbers in the early 60s and would be common in standard issue by the mid-60s and would remain so through the rest of the 20th century in one degree or the other. Very successful gun. Italy even exported these to quite a few nations. Now in Switzerland, their first self-loading rifle after the K31 bolt action was this critter here. This is the STGW57, also known as the PE57, or in SIG parlance, the SG510. Now this is the original version, sometimes called the 510 or the 510-1. It is chambered for the Swiss 7.5 by 55 GP11 cartridge. So this is a true full power cartridge. We can debate if 7.62 NATO is a large intermediate round or a small full power, but 7.5 GP11 is definitely a full power cartridge dating back before World War I. And this is what Switzerland would develop. The original prototype was the AM55 with the final version being the STG, excuse, yeah, the STG-57, the SG-510, adopted in 1957. And this would see standard service until the 1990s, and still a lot of reservists would keep them up until quite recently. Now, this gun is really interesting, and it has its own videos. It, it takes a lot of features. What we really care about here, we have flip-up sights, we have a hooded front post, and we have an ad adjustable peep style rear. We have this light bipod, which slides up and down. You can lock it in the front or the back on this heat shield here, barrel shroud. We have a single piece barrel, and by that I mean the flash hider is integral, it's part of this barrel. It's physically one piece of this very long, very ornately done barrel. We have a grenade ring here. We have a Swiss bayonet lug here. This feeds from Rockin 25 round box magazines. Now interestingly, these mags are made out of a very lightweight alloy quite advanced. Now also interestingly this alloy is machined from a single block. There's not a seam or a weld line. The lower is held on with a push pin. You can't just push it from the side. You have to also push a button on this side and then push it out. We'll see why that's important in a bit. Recoil springs in the stock so you really couldn't have a folding stock on this. and a little carry handle because. To my mind, this gun, it seems like they couldn't quite decide if they wanted an infantry rifle or a light machine gun. It has some elements to me that harken to a light machine gun. Whereas with the Beretta, the BM-59, they're essentially updating the Garand. As I said, this is the paratrooper version. 
They had a version just like this, but with a fixed stock with the pistol grip. The standard version has more of a grand style uh, straight stock with a semi pistol grip. And this has the shorter barrel. The paratrooper will have the shortest barrel of them all at roughly 18 inches. The standard rifle would have a 19 and a half inch barrel. And there was a slightly longer barrel version just under 21 inches. With the SIG, we just have the standard barrel. There was never really a carbine used in Switzerland. So, while I'm introducing these and showing these features, you'll understand, I hope. After both nations adopted these weapons, Switzerland developed the SG 510 4 for the nation of Chile. Now, this was a modified carbine version of this weapon here firing 7.62 NATO. Well having had experience with 7.62 NATO Beretta and SIG partnered. Beretta actually helped quite a bit developing the 510-4 beginning in the early 60s and in fact they even proposed an improved prototype known as the BL-62, which seems to have not gone anywhere. It was a, a prototype of this, but they changed up the stock and pistol grip arrangement. So they were working on the design. Beretta even made some 510-4 guns. So this is where a partnership began. Well, this worked out pretty well. So in 1963, both SIG and Beretta partnered up to develop a new select fire light infantry rifle or really carbine firing the then extremely new 223 remington cartridge which had only started to see limited field use in vietnam and other places in the last couple of years it was really the hot new thing h and k would get in on this with the hk 33 around the same time as well so beretta and sig would partner together in the 1960s developed this rifle and what they came up with was the SG 530 at least in Swiss speak. The SG 530 was an interesting gun. Originally it used the roller delay system from this weapon here. This does not have a gas system. It uses a roller system similar to the HK we know or the Setme but a little bit different it would use that. Well, unfortunately, they did not have it tuned properly and 223 at the time was uh, such a new cartridge that it wasn't that well known. They were having trouble with the roller system in the SG530. So they would add a gas piston system, not it was dissimilar, but not too far off from what's in the BM59, basically a long stroke gas piston. This version would be a hybrid and the final would be the SG 530-1. So we have rollers on the bolt and a long stroke gas piston system firing 223. This would have a 15.4 inch barrel. It would feed from rock in 30 round mags and it really was why Beretta and SIG split ways. Beretta did not like the idea of the roller system. SIG did. Beretta wanted to go to a two lug rotating bolt, again not too dissimilar, at least in concept, to what's in this BM59. Because this uses a Garand style bolt that rotates to lock and unlock with two large lugs. They thought combining this style of bolt with the long stroke piston was the way to go. And uh, SIG did not. They wanted to keep on with the roller. Well, this disagreement became serious and became enough of an impasse that in 1968, both companies, really Beretta left the partnership, but both companies dissolved the partnership and would go their own ways. Okay, we'll stop there. And that gets us back to these guns here. After the, this, the, the breakup of the partnership, 
Beretta would continue working on its design and it would go immediately to using its two lug rotating bolt combined with the long stroke piston it had worked together with SIG to design. And really, by 1969, very late in the year, almost 1970, they had a working prototype ready to show off. And they really had a gun ready to be sold commercially in 1972, and that's where the AR-70 arises from. This gun was commercially available in the early 70s, and it was modestly successful for a few reasons. One, it was one of the fully developed, reliable, and quite frankly, less expensive alternatives in the 223 market. You have to remember in the early 70s, there weren't a lot of options for that caliber. Not like today, certainly. It was well-made and durable, relatively simple, pretty soldier-proof, and just generally speaking, worked. You know, and in the end, it was used by about 14 countries and some at least numbers worth talking about. The Italian military never adopted this as its official standard service weapon. However, Italian Special Forces and the Italian Navy and the Italian Air Force did purchase these in, in not insignificant numbers. You know, several thousand, maybe 10 or 20, hard to say. You had this version here, the rifle with an 18 inch barrel, the AR-70. There was also the S SC-70, which had a folding metal stock. And there was the SCS-70, which had a folding metal stock and a short 14 and a half inch barrel as a carbine. So there were three, three main versions. There was also plans to make a light machine gun version, but this never really happened. So you really see the same kind of ideas for configurations for this as with the BM-59. Also with the BM-59, we have a, the same bayonet lug here. We have a different muzzle device, but we still launch the same grenades, grenade sights here. The folding light bipod is almost identical. In fact, the, the legs are. Now we do not have a fold down winter trigger in this version, but we do have a pretty large trigger guard. We have a mag catch, AK style, same as on the BM-59. We have a pistol grip that's somewhat similar, it's a different pistol grip, but it also has storage for a cleaning kit. We have simple flip rear sights. And we feed from rock in 30 round mags. I bet to a lot of people these look like Galil mags. It's just back in the early 70s, there was no standardization. Really, the M16 mags are pretty well looked down upon because they weren't as durable and reliable. And at that time, 30 round M16 mags are still kind of coming into heavy use. So, a lot of the early 223 mags used by several guns resembled this steel stamped rock in style. Now, in Swiss land, SIG would keep on trying to perfect the roller system for 223 for some time. However, by the early 70s, they would give up on it and they would switch to you making the SG540. Now the SG540 uses a rotating two lug bolt, so in the end Beretta was really correct about the correct system. They would also keep the long stroke gas piston, and the 540 would use more stamped parts and cast parts, as would the AR70. Both of these would use as stamped and welded receivers. Initially, the 540 would also be offered as a carbine with a 14 inch barrel and as a rifle with an 18. And it would have full auto, semi auto selector options. They would 
a, develop a three round burst alternative mode which you could convert but you had to swap parts out so you could either have full auto or three round burst in the uh, 540. They would also introduce the adopter pattern sights we know today and a folding light bipod different from that in the PE57 but same idea in other words they're both pretty crappy bipods frankly they both like to collapse on you from there and just to say that the 540 would see some modest success uh, they would actually be manufactured under license in France by Menuhin and used by the French military in limited numbers until the FAMAS was available in large enough quantities to satisfy. So it saw some limited French military use. Well, an updated version known as the 541 was unveiled in 1979 and this was for Swiss military trials. What really pushed Switzerland over the edge into finally adopting a small caliber, now this is a nation of long-range target shooters, so they were pretty content with the 7.5 and, and, and the 7, excuse me, the P57 rifle, but once the SS-109, the 62 grain heavier round was introduced from Belgium and was accepted more or less for NATO, this pushed them over the edge to finally go ahead and adopt a 223 caliber weapon. So in 1983, the 541 rifle and the 543 carbine version were officially selected for future adoption and uh, further refinements. Along with them, the new cartridge was being developed called 5.6. It was essentially analogous to the SS-109, but it was a 60 three grain projectile and just a little bit different dimensionally but still pretty much interchangeable and it would use a 1 in 10 twist rate instead of a 1 in 12 early and then 1 in 7 late for the heavier NATO bullets. In 1984 the 55 excuse me the 541 rifle was developed into the 550 this weapon here and the 543 carbine was developed into the 551 carbine which we have other videos on. And these had some further improvements. For example, this pattern of side folding skeleton stock would become standard. A four way fire mode selector would become standard. The adopter sites. They would find ways to speed up mass production a bit, streamline it. We would have a 20.9 inch barrel, much like with the PE57. This is all integral. The flash shutter is physically part of the barrel. It's machined as all one, one piece. And we would update the gas system a bit to be more corrosion resistant. They started to use more stainless steel components. Well, the 550 was slated to be adopted and even in 1986, the Swiss Army began to receive its first guns. But uh, a few issues setting up production arose and also the budget there wasn't in the budget so in the end these were not adopted as the STG W90 until 1990 now this uses a rock in mag almost the same exact style as on the Beretta but we have a 20 round polymer mag that locks together as most of probably all of you know this style this was standard, they kind of went away from the 30. Although they did make a 30 round mag as an option and more recently it's come into uh, more frequent use. This does have a folding trigger rather than a winter trigger. So we have a folding trigger guard for use with gloves. And we have the same type of takedown pin rear and front is on the PE-57. So there's some elements carried over from that as well. And the mag catch is very similar to the PE-57's mag catch. So you can really see where these guns borrowed from their predecessors and we're about to see how they are similar and different from each other internally. Just to say this gun as I said was adopted in 1990. This gun, the AR-70, never really was 
adopted. However, it was updated in the late 80s for Italian military trials by Beretta and became the AR-7090 when it was adopted also in 1990. The updated version would take standard AR-15 M60 mags, it would have more ambidextrous controls, it would have a more standard scope mount on the top, and it would have a reinforced upper receiver. Same basic gun, but quite a few updates to become. It's both interesting though that these guns went through several evolutions and both ended up being adopted in one form or the other in 1990. So let's take a gander inside of these guys. I'm just taking mags out guys to get them out of my way. It's really neat that the, the Swiss gun is pretty well known and we even have some disassembling videos of this one, but there's not a lot known about the Beretta. And it is an interesting gun. I don't know why I just did that. This disassembles in a very unique way. See, now I'm stroke. To take this apart, it's similar to the SIG, but you do need a bullet tip. Instead of having a, a push button here, we have a hole you use to pull this back, and then you can pull your bolt handle out. We have a rear takedown pin. It is captive. I'm just gonna put that in my pocket. Seems easier. Da -da -da -da. Slings. Once you crack it open like that, there is our bolt group. Now let's compare that to the swig over here. We have a rear pin as well. Now this one is removable if you need to. It pulls out, but usually I just leave it in the gun because you can kind of leave it hanging. Put that in the... Kind of wish they had a spot. Now this one's a little easier to take apart. You can use your finger by pressing that down and then pulling handle out. Here is your bolt group and this one. The Beretta is a larger bolt group, more massive system here. The firing pin stays in the carrier, much like on a FN, FNC. Kind of interesting. That's kind of an early style. Whereas on the Swiss, your firing pin is in the bolt itself, more AK style. Now once we do that, grab my takedown pin, let's put this in the pocket. To take this apart further, there's a front pin that comes out. If I can get her here. separate your upper and your lower. You see the trigger group here. Got our folding stock here. For the Beretta, we have another front pin. Now this one is more fixed as you see. So we're just going to leave it in. It's more of a hinge design. 
here is our trigger group. It's a little different style. Very, uh, eh, kind of AR-15, I'd say. Now, the reason we separated this slings is for disassembly further. If we do that, we can take off our handguard. Come on. There we go. The bipod is part of it, but it rotates off if you need to. Pretty simple. Which is good because this bipod doesn't have a lot else to recommend it, guys. <laughs> here you can see the barrel the upper handguard just pulls off as well there's our gas tube now the gas system if there's a button here you press if I can get it with my finger there we go that's your gas regulator gas piston See, it's a very much a, a long stroke setup. And you can even take your gas tube out by rotating it further if you need to. I'm just going to leave it in to keep things simple as possible for myself, guys. Forgive me for that. I'm going to put this back together for right now because that make my life easier. I'm going to clip my sling on this. This has a spring-loaded catch. I'm going to flip up the grenade sight so you can see it. There's a spring-loaded catch here. That unscrews your flash hider. They definitely have a long enough thread on that, don't they? See? And the reason we do that is once that's off, This just comes forward and off. So the whole gas block, gas tube assembly, as you see, comes off. And now we have our gas piston. Let me see here, guys. I want my handguard to fall on the floor. I think I need to get that front pin out. I guess I'll just leave it on. I'm trying to make my life too complicated, if you don't blame me. So here's our gas piston here. And all this. If you notice, we have a very similar system to this. In fact, where they locked together with the bolt is virtually the same. This has a braided spring, this has a more traditional spring. One thing I find unusual, the gas block pulls right off, yet the bipod is pretty well clamped to this barrel. You can remove it, but not as easily as on the SIG. It's just a standard barrel here. Here's our rear grenade sight. So yeah, you can really see where the gas systems are almost the same. And the bolts are very similar. Although I would say the Beretta isn't quite as advanced because of having the, uh, the firing pin as part of the carrier instead of being part of the bolt, which is pretty much the standard these days. I mean, it just seems a little weird to me. 
and he gets a heavier bolt group. This is a little bit lighter. The lugs are a little smaller on this. So on and so forth. Okay, we'll stop there. All right, we're back together now. So, you know, that gives you a, an idea of how these are actually very, very similar from their kind of mutual origin. And even where they're used, if you think about it, you have the Swiss Alps, you have the Italian Alps. So there's a certain commonality there of landscape. Now, Italy, Beretta definitely exported more of its rifles, be it the BM-59, the AR-70 than SIG did for its the 510 and the 550 series. But these are both products of refinements in the 70s and 80s and were both adopted at the same time. The AR7090, the militarized version of this, is being phased out for the AR160, the, excuse me, the ARX160. The STGW90 is still in standard Swiss service today and probably will remain so for, for the foreseeable future. But I just thought since we were talking about these guns in separate videos and how they were closely related, we'd try to show a little bit of that. Again, they both have receiver halves. The trigger groups are pretty similar. We have uh, stamped steel, it's welded together. The Beretta guns are significantly less expensive to make than the SIG. Maybe they're not quite as well refined, but I will say this is a very smooth, very pleasant gun. So nothing against it. Really, when it comes to shooting them, I find them equally enjoyable. And the Berettas, the, the pre-bands such as this, are quite a bit cheaper than the pre-band SIGs. So that's something to consider. You might consider this kind of the poor man's uh, SIG 550. It's got a slightly shorter barrel at 18 inches versus uh, 21 on that. but And the folding stocks for these are out there, but they're pretty rare and expensive. The good news is if you do find one, they're interchangeable with the, uh, with the fixed stocks, so you can just swap between. And of course, both of these do take proprietary mags. The Swiss mags are pretty available. You can usually find the... 20 rounders for 30 to 40 bucks and the 30 rounders for 60 to 70. The Beretta mags really only come in 30. There's also a short eight round sport mag, but you know, those are pretty uncommon. The 30 rounds for these are quite expensive. You can find sometimes heavily used, but still serviceable ones for around $50 with brand new looking ones for over a hundred. So the, the mags for these are kind of the, the, the pitfall, honestly. I only have five for this one myself, four of the 30s and one of the small eights that this came with. As imports, both of these came in a little neutered. The 550s back in the 80s, they did not machine out the grenade ring and they machined off the bayonet lug. The AR-70s back in the 80s originally would not have the bayonet lug or the grenade accoutrements either, but I've added these back from a parts kit. So yeah, you know, these both came in in very small numbers. Probably fewer than 500 of these came in in the 80s, and it's really hard to say how many of the Berettas came in, but the number seems to be under 2,000. Some people say as low as 500, but I've seen anywhere from 500 to 2,000. Well, if you have any questions or comments, please share them below. If you like the video, please click like. If you haven't already subscribed, we'd really appreciate it if you would. And if you like this kind of, kind of video, we have other disassembly and comparison videos as, far, as well as range videos for both of these. So please check that out as well. Well, This is Misha. We appreciate you tuning in. And we'll catch you next time.